We are doing a four-part series on Ezekiel. It is quite an easy book. Part one is the prophecy against Judah, and it's from chapter 1 to 24. Part two is the prophecy against foreign nations. It's from chapters 25 to 32. Part three is the restoration of Israel from chapters 33 to 39. And part four, you have the Millennium Temple, and that's from chapters 40 to 48. Now, in this four-part series, we are just study the highlights of Ezekiel. As with any book in the Bible, especially the prophetic books, you got to understand the relevance of the book in regards to the time period we are living in today. Ezekiel was prophesying during a very important period of Israel's history, at the time of the siege of Jerusalem. So he was prophesying during a time when Jerusalem was under attack. Now, there are four major sieges of Jerusalem. Four. First, by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in 86 BC. And during that siege, the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed. Solomon's temple and the entire city was burned to the ground. So that was a very major attack and the whole city was destroyed. The second major siege of Jerusalem was when Titus of Rome came in 70 AD, and the second temple was destroyed. This was the temple that Jesus walked into. This was the temple with the gate beautiful where Peter and John healed a lame man, and that temple was also destroyed. The third major siege hasn't happened yet. It is going to come in the future. The Bible prophesies that at the end of the church age, we don't know when, could be in our lifetime. So at the end of the church age, we're going to find a major attack by the armies of the world against Jerusalem, and that will usher in the second coming of Jesus. And then 1,000 years after that, at the end of the millennium, is 3,000 and something something, the Lord will again defend Jerusalem when the Antichrist will be released from the pit and the armies of Gog and Magog will congregate together for one final attack. And that will be the time when the Antichrist and Satan will be cast into a lake of fire forever. Therefore, Ezekiel has great relevance because the conditions prior to the fall of Jerusalem in his days are going to be very similar to the conditions In our time, the book of Ezekiel will have many spiritual truths that will apply to our day and the time in which we live. You got to understand the last five kings of Judah. Counting down, you have Josiah. He's a very important man. He reigned from 640 to 609 BC for 31 years. After him was Jehoahaz. He reigned for three months in 609 BC. And then after that, you have Jehoiakim. And he reigned for 11 years, from 609 to 598 BC. And after him, you have Jehoiakim, from 598 to 597, for only three months, from the December of 98 to the February of 597 BC. And finally, the last king is Zedekiah, from 597 to 587 BC, And he reigned for 11 years. So those were the last five kings of Judah. Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. So you go to 2 Kings 23. If you look at verse 21, it says, Then the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. Surely such a Passover had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. So Josiah was a very young king. Look what he did, verse 24. Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, the household gods and idols, 
and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Before him there was no king like him, who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. So what an amazing man. He was a young king, but he loved God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might. And so the mightiest revival that Israel had ever known took place in the days of Josiah. And this was just prior to the fall of Jerusalem because after his reign, 20 over years later, Jerusalem was destroyed. So the Bible prophesies just before the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Antichrist and the Gentile nations will surround Jerusalem and besiege Jerusalem for three and a half years or for 42 months. Similarly, prior to this attack of Jerusalem in the end times, could well be in our days, there will be a mighty revival that is going to sweep through the whole world. And in fact, we could already be living in the beginning of this revival. Because all over the world, in China, in Africa, in India, people are coming to Christ in numbers unheard of before. We could well be witnessing the beginning of this global revival already. In fact, Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1, it says, Arise and shine, for our light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon us. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says that that happens. God arises and shines over you at a time when darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you. The darkness will accumulate to the manifestation of the Antichrist who will seek to overthrow Jerusalem. So at a time when immorality is increasing around the world, at a time when wickedness is increasing everywhere, when there's unrest, when there are wars and rumors of wars, you're going to find that the church will experience the greatest revival in its entire history. The study of Ezekiel, therefore, has great, great relevance to the time period that you and I are living in. So let's understand this man, Ezekiel. The name Ezekiel means the Lord strengthens. And Ezekiel is very special because he portrays Jesus Christ in a very real, practical sense. For one, he was constantly referred to as the Son of Man. Ezekiel, Son of Man. Arise, Son of Man. Prophesy, Son of Man, to my people. And the term Son of Man was also the phrase that Jesus used concerning himself. Another thing, Ezekiel was a priest called to be a prophet, but he was also a very good shepherd, a pastor. Jesus is the priest, prophet, and king. So very similar. Another interesting thing, Ezekiel started his ministry when he was 30 years old. How old was Jesus when he started his earthly ministry? 30 years old. Their lives run parallel to each other. Ezekiel, like Jesus, was a very compassionate man. When King Nebuchadnezzar laid siege of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar led three waves of invasion. Ezekiel was among the captives in the second invasion. And so he was prophesying from the land of Babylon. At his time, when he was prophesying, the city of Jerusalem and Solomon's temple were not destroyed yet. They were still standing. The city was standing. The temple was standing. Ezekiel was raised up by God 
to warn the people of the coming destruction, of the impending judgment. So in the first three chapters, we see him receiving his calling to be the prophet to the people. Ezekiel chapter 1. And let's look at verse 1. Now, it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kiba, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. The first thing about being a prophet is that you can see very real and open vision. You have major prophets and you have minor prophets. That is why a prophet is also called a seer. Because he sees into the invisible realm of the supernatural and he could see into the future. Ezekiel was so amazing. He not only saw heaven, he saw the future, not only to the first coming of Christ, and not only to the second coming of Christ, but even to the end of the millennium, to the end of time, and to the beginning of eternity. So he was really an amazing man. He was a prophet. Notice how God defines a prophet in the scripture. Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. And here was God defending Moses to his brother Aaron and sister Miriam. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in the vision and I speak to him in a dream. So you notice what God says? If you are a true prophet, you'll be gifted in visions and dreams. So a prophet is very much given to visions and dreams. And he sees very clearly into the supernatural, into the future. Verse 2, on the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, Jehoiakim is the second last king of Judah. He too was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar during the second invasion. This is the fifth year of Jehoiakim's captivity. Ezekiel was 25 years old when he was taken prisoner into Babylon. He had stayed in Babylon for five years. And now he's raised up by God to speak to Jerusalem, to speak to the people there, to warn them of the coming destruction. Here Ezekiel gives a description of what he saw concerning heaven. But it wasn't easy because how to describe something that has no similarity on the earth? How to describe things that normal human eyes have never seen before? He was struggling. He did his best to describe the vision. And it's very hard for the reader to visualize what is being described because there's no comparison in this life on this earth. Ezekiel struggled to find analogies to communicate his vision. He used words like, well, what I saw resembles this. It is like that. He used words like likeness, appearance, again and again in many of his visions. Let's go to verse 3. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kiva. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. The hand of the Lord is the Old Testament way of saying the anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon him. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah, also another prophet, he broke the famine. He broke the drought. Remember, three and a half years earlier, he prayed, and at his word, God stopped the rain. Three and a half years later, he prayed, and God sent the rain. So now, this is in 1 Kings 18, Elijah prayed, and it started to pour, and it got heavier and heavier and heavier. Well, when God sends his rain, it pours. Ahab the king got onto his chariot, and rode all the way back to the city of Jezreel because he didn't want to get wet. So he was going very fast. Ezekiel wanted to get back, but he had no horses. 
And guess what the Bible says in 1 Kings 18 and verse 46. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. He got up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. When the hand of God came upon Elijah, he became a superhero. He became the flesh. He ran so fast. He overtook Ahab. And he reached the city of Jezreel before the king in his chariots. So the hand of the Lord is the anointing of the Holy Spirit that will enable an ordinary person to do supernatural things. So we must pray and seek God for his hand to come upon us. Amen? Now look at verse 4. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its mist, like the color of amber, out of the mist of the fire. Now Ezekiel saw a whirlwind. Now a whirlwind could be a tornado, could be a hurricane. He was describing power. He saw something powerful. Now remember on the day of Pentecost, the 120 were seated in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. When God moves, He moves in power. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3 talks about the movement of God. It says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has His way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of His feet. When God moves, His movement is like the whirlwind. He moves in great power. The whirlwind came out of the north. The Bible gives us the geographical location of where God lives. Now, of course, God is everywhere. But God's throne is established, it seems, in the Bible in the north. For example, we have verses like Psalm 75, verse 6 to 7. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. If promotion or exaltation does not come from the east, if it does not come from the west, if it does not come from the south, then where does it come from? From the north. And then the Bible says, who stays in the north? And God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. The north is where the throne of God is. When the Bible talks about Satan, when he was Lucifer, the angel, Lucifer became proud and he fell into sin. In Isaiah 14 and verse 13, for you have said in your heart, and here it describes the words and the attitude of Lucifer, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. Now where? On the farther sides of the north. So when Satan wanted to usurp the throne of God, where was he aiming? He was aiming on the farther sides of the north. I don't know about this because I'm not an astronomer. But I read astronomers say that if you take the axis of the earth and the north pole and you draw a line all the way up, you find a very strange phenomenon. When you draw a line all the way up north from the earth, it will not come across any stars or galaxy. It's like there's an empty space into nothingness. So it could well be that beyond the second heaven of the universe, and God dwells in the third heaven. On the location on the farther side of the north, you come to the third heaven, and there you'll find the throne of God. At a time when the people of God were greatly oppressed by Nebuchadnezzar, God appeared to Ezekiel to encourage him, to tell Ezekiel that I'm still the God who is in charge. I'm the God of great power and glory. So tonight, I'm here to tell you, my friends, no matter what crisis you're experiencing 
in your life, in your marriage, in your career, in your ministry, or us as a church, our God is still the God who is in charge. He's still the God of great power and great glory. Look at verse 5. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. So out of God's power and glory, Ezekiel saw four living creatures. And they were the angels. Ezekiel chapter 10 tells us they were the cherubim. Cherub is singular, cherubim, plural. The cherubim, they had the likeness of a man. Verse 6, each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Each cherub has four wings. Now in Isaiah chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 4, you have the seraphim and they have six wings. The seraphim are the worshipping angels. Now the cherubim on the other hand are the security angels. They are the bodyguard angels. They are the fighter warrior angels. So they are there to protect God's interest. They are there to ensure God's glory is being upheld. When Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden, God did not put a seraph at the entrance. He put a cherub. A cherub is a protection angel. The cherubim are on both sides of the mercy seat with their wings hovering over it because they are there to protect, to provide security to God's presence. If there are angels with six wings and angels with four wings, surely there must be angels with two wings. Who could they be? Now, we don't know. They're probably the ordinary angels. They could well be the guardian angels for all our children. I mean, every kid has a guardian angel. Notice, all angels are servants of God. How did they serve God? Look at verse 7. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. Our feet govern our walk. Their feet were straight. In other words, they were upright in their service of God. They served the Lord with uprightness. So they were not turning to the right hand or to the left hand. They are very focused. They are very obedient. When God wants them to move, they move. They don't meander. They just go straight. Now, one of the characteristics of a priest in the book of Leviticus is that he got to have straight feet. Now, when the Bible says that, it doesn't mean that God is discriminating against those that have crooked feet. But everything in the Bible is symbolic, all right? It's written for our instruction to teach us a lesson here. The priest in Leviticus must have straight feet. They got to be walking in the path of obedience. They cannot be walking in crookedness. Therefore, we need to cry out to God. God, we love to serve you. But God, please strengthen my feet. God, please let me walk in uprightness in obedience to you. Now, the soles of their feet were like the soles of calf's feet. Now, calf is a baby ox, a young ox. Now, in the scripture, the calf is, or the ox is always the symbol of servanthood. So the cherubim is a perfect picture of a servant, a picture of absolute dedication in the service of God. Now, verse 8, the hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Verse 9, their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. So this is another beautiful picture of dedication, of not turning aside, meandering, deviating to the right, deviating to the left. You see, in fact, the word deviate comes from the word deviant or devil. So Satan constantly seeks to deviate you, to divert you, to distract you so that you will not walk the path that God wants you to walk in, 
to move you away from the original path that God wants you to travel on. Remember in obeying God to go to the cross, when Jesus was going to the cross, it says, Jesus steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem. So he cannot be diverted. He cannot be deterred. God the Father have said so. He knew that going to the cross is his lot. He went. Nothing can stop him. He set his face. He was very focused. And that is the mark of a good servant. A good servant always remembers what his or her master had said. A good servant sets his heart on it and doesn't allow anything to distract him. And he has the discipline. Jesus had the discipline. The cherubim had the discipline to stay focused and not deviate from his calling. Verse 10, As for the lightness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of the lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of the ox on the left side. Each of the four had the face of an eagle. Every cherub has four faces. The front face is the face of a man. So if you meet an angel, the first thing you're going to notice, the angel looks like a human. He looks like a man. That is why the Bible says sometimes you can entertain angels unaware. That means the person that is nice to you, or you got lost suddenly, a person come and show you a direction. For all you know, he could be an angel. The Bible says many of us entertain angels and we don't even know it. And then that's why I remember the day after the Sabbath and the women went to the tomb and they saw a young man. And yet the young man was an angel. The first impression of an angel is that he's a man because that is the front face. The right side is the face of a lion. The left side is the face of an ox. The back face is the face of an eagle. The four faces of the cherubim show us the four sides of Christ's ministry, the four aspects of Jesus Christ, and they correspond to the four Gospels in the New Testament. First, you have the face of a man, and that is the Gospel of Luke. Because Luke portrays Christ, Jesus, as the Son of Man. So every time you read Luke, you find it talks about Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. Why? Luke talks about the humanity of Christ, that Jesus truly is human. The compassion he has as a human. The temptations he struggled with as a man. It talks about the humanity of Christ, the manhood of Christ. The face of the lion corresponds to the gospel of Matthew. The lion is the king of the jungle. So Matthew talks about Jesus as the king. More than any other book in the Bible, Matthew always talks about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. Matthew portrays Christ as the king of kings. And then you have the face of the ox. And that corresponds to the gospel of Mark. Mark portrays Jesus as the servant. Because the ox plows the field. The ox, the whole life is to serve the farmer. Christ has come to be our servant. How Jesus wants to serve us so much, he's willing to suffer for us. Mark talks about Christ, the suffering servant. If you want to serve God, then like Jesus, you cannot be afraid of sufferings. You see, the apostle Paul brings out a truth about suffering. Colossians 1 and verse 24, and Paul says this, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul is an apostle. He's a leader. He says, I rejoice. I celebrate in my sufferings for you. Because I'm filling up in my flesh. That means I suffer in my flesh for the sake of the church. As a pastoral leader, a cell leader, 
a zone supervisor, a church staff, or just a leader, maybe in the business world, in the corporate world for God. As a pastoral leader, you are a priest. And the ministry of a priest is the ministry of suffering. You'll be required time and time again to partake in the sufferings of Christ for those under your care. Sometimes you may have to suffer in your body, like Paul, or suffer in your soul. Paul says, I get tormented by worries. I have sleepless nights. I got to fast often. Sometimes you, get, you suffer even in your spirit. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that your life is less than what it's supposed to be. But you're willing to go through suffering because this is on behalf of the flock so that God can move mightily in their lives. Now, look at 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 12. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. Paul says, death is working in me so that the life of God can work in you. So often, the death of Christ must be in the pastor so that the life of Christ can be revealed to the congregation. The back face is the face of an eagle. Eagle soars in the heavenly. This corresponds to the gospel of John. John portrays Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior that came down from heaven. It is in John that we find the most famous verse, John 3, 16. It talks about Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus as the one who came down from heaven. But I want you to notice, while you can talk about Jesus as the man, the king, the servant, and as the son of God, the front face of the cherubim is always that of a man, the face of a man. There'll be times when you need the authority of a lion or the humility of a servant or the spirituality of an eagle. But the face that I must present to the world is that of a human. So being spiritual doesn't mean you lose your humanity. Being spiritual doesn't mean you lose your human side. Now remember, God celebrated human nature so much. He himself took on the form of a man, not of an angel but of a man. So he's known as Jesus of Nazareth, the man from Galilee. Not only the son of God, but Jesus, the son of man. And even in eternity, Jesus is now forever known as the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is not ashamed to first project, I'm a human, my humanity. I'm not ashamed of my humanity. I mean, look at Jesus. When he's hungry, he ate. When he's tired, he slept. When he's sad, he wept. Jesus, totally God, but totally man. And the face that we should present to our world is that of a human. The presentation of all the heroes of faith you find in the Bible was that they were human. Think about Abraham and Joseph and Moses and Daniel and Esther, Jesus Christ. They were all human, although they were all very spiritual, given to visions and dreams. They did not suppress their own human needs. Don't become so spiritually minded, you're of no earthly use. The more spiritual you get, you should become a better man a better woman. The more spiritual you are, the more perfected your human nature should be. The likeness of the cherubim is that of a man. The front face, the first appearance, the first time you see an angel, you always can see the humanity. But let's not stop there. The dominant nature of a cherubim is that of an ox. I want you to go with me to Ezekiel 10 and verse 14. And I want you to see the four faces that he describes right here. Each one had four faces. 
The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face, the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. The fourth, the face of an eagle. In Ezekiel 10, 14, you have man, lion, cherub, eagle. The predominant nature of a cherub is that of an ox, which explains why the feet of the cherubim are that of a calf, a young ox. The ultimate expression of the cherubim is that of a servant. The characteristic of the cherubim is his faithfulness in serving the Lord. The cherubim is totally loyal, totally sold out to the cause of his master. You see, Jesus was the same. Jesus came to be the servant of all. You look at Philippians 2 and verse 5 and all the way to verse 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind, that means have the same attitude. Let this attitude that Jesus has be in you. Verse 6, who being in a form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Likeness of a man, nature of a born servant. Jesus is the likeness of a man, but his nature, the nature of Christ, is that of a born servant. And that is why in Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. A ransom for many. We are called to be servants of the Most High. We are called, like the cherubim, to safeguard God's interest and to uphold His glory that God will increase more and more. We will decrease in humility. So while we may have the authority of a lion, the divinity of an eagle, and we show our full humanity to the whole world, let's not forget our supreme motivation, our true nature must always to be a servant of all. The supreme motivation must always be a servant of all. But in all things, balance is the key of life. There are four faces. We must balance our humanity with our spirituality. Balance our authority with our servanthood. Now, let's go on to verse 11. Thus were their faces, their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each touched one another, and two covered their bodies. And each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. Now, notice, wherever the Holy Spirit would guide them, that's the place they would go. We are commanded not just to be filled in the Spirit, but we are commanded to walk in the Spirit. You see, Romans 8 and verse 4 say that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Where the Spirit of God wants us to go, that's where we will go. Romans 8 verse 14 for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You see, only then, when you are led every day by the Spirit, can we mature into sons and daughters of God. The word sons in the Greek is this word huos, which means a mature adult son who can accept responsibility for the father's estate. God wants you to come to a place. In His estate, in the kingdom of God, there are true riches. There are anointings God wants you to have. There are territories God wants you to conquer. There are inheritance God wants you to possess. But He can't give it to you if you never grew up to be an adult spiritual son and daughter of His. Jesus says in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Notice Jesus says, My sheep, not my lamb. But you know what? Lambs get lost all the time. 
But sheep, they hear the voice. They can discern the voice. So discerning the voice of God is an important sign of your spirituality, of your maturity. As Christians, especially as church leaders, we must constantly keep taking reference checks so that we know if we are on course in the will of God. You see, it's not just sufficient to say, well, I'm hearing from God, I'm hearing from God. That's just one point. Have you checked if indeed you're hearing from God? You know, have you checked with the Scripture? Is the decision you're making in line with the Holy Scripture? Have you checked with the Holy Spirit? Do I have the peace of the Spirit in my heart? Have you checked the circumstance? You know, if God is asking you to go into the mission field, is there an open door? The circumstance got to open up. Have you checked with others? Don't just check with one person, but check with a group of people you respect. Why? Because in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. This requires humility. You got to accept the fact that you don't know everything all the time, that your impulse may be wrong. So you got to check and you got to be able to accurately assess your direction and to take counsel, especially when it requires humility to check with counselors to ensure you're hearing correctly from God. All right, verse 13. And as the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. So Ezekiel saw the cherubim on fire. Now, serving God is only effective when it's done with passion, when it's done with fire. Look at verse 14. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. So the cherubim moved very fast in high speed like flashes of lightning. That tells you one thing. They are very willing to obey the will of God. They are very quick to obey the will of God. Now, as I look at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. Some people think that Ezekiel was describing a UFO, a spaceship, because it talks about a wheel. Now, what he saw was that the angels, like they're moving on wheels, they're moving very fast in the heavens. In 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Now, the end times are going to be filled with battles. Every day, we hear wars and rumors of wars globally. But what is happening in the natural is always a reflection of the spiritual. So, there is very intense spiritual warfare in the invisible realm. We are constantly in this warfare. And that is why Jesus says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. That is why Jesus speaks very clearly about our need for strength. Now here in Ezekiel, we have a beautiful vision of the throne of God moving rapidly, speeding throughout the heavens. But for what purpose? To show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is 100% loyal to him. To give strength to those who are weak so that the weak can say, I am strong. The enemy may come like a flood, but God will raise up a mighty standard against it. Isaiah 40 and verse 28 is a powerful passage. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And he says in verse 29, he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. In the natural Young people are supposed to be full of vigor. They don't fall. But the battles that we are fighting is spiritual in nature. It's beyond natural strength. 
is beyond human strength. So we need the strength of the Lord. In verse 31, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I love it when the Bible says, those who wait on God shall renew their strength. The word renew in Hebrew is kalev. That means to exchange. So we exchange our limited human strength, as puny as it is, to receive the strength of God. Remember, the race it's not always to the swift, not to the strong, but it's to those to whom God has shown grace, that God has given strength. So let's touch God tonight. The presence of God is here right now so that His strength may flow into us, so that we are able to run and not be weary, to walk and not faint, so that we can look at all our problems and say, praise God. I have received your strength, O oh Lord. I'm well able to overcome my enemy. I can take the strong man in the city. I can keep on moving. I can keep on running and not faint. I can keep on walking. I can keep on serving the Lord. Not by my own strength, but by the strength that God has given to me. How many of you tonight, maybe in your walk with God, you feel weary? Maybe in your serving of God, you feel tired. Listen, there's only so much we can take. But when God gives us His strength, then all things become possible. How many of you want the strength of the Lord tonight? Why don't we just all stand on our feet right now?